Right. So, hope you're doing well. And as I speak to you all, uh, the, because this is a relatively intimate group, I'm actually hoping we can have a real conversation. But first, I you know, share with you some of the slides and, uh, you know, what's going on. So I'll give a short presentations and then presentation and then we will chat. Um, okay. Let me know if you can see it, but generally should be okay. Right. Oh, somebody uh, is late. Hey, uh, there are more people coming. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that I'm seeing the chat. Everything is on my screen. Um, Oops. Ah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have I forgot how to use uh, PowerPoint view slideshow. Yes. Okay. Um, now, sorry. You know what? I don't want to use uh, the slide mode because then I don't see you somehow on my screen. So hopefully it will be fine. This way you'll see how many more slides I have. All right, let's go. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, great to see you. We're supposed to be doing this more than a year ago. So um, we um, for uh, the SIAM, uh, SIAG opt officers as of um, January 1st, 2020. And uh, we were basically, uh, you know, supposed to be presenting ourselves and our future plans and everything in the SIOPT meeting um, in 2020. But as we all know, that didn't happen. So somewhat belated everybody. We are, so myself, Sam Burr, who's the vice chair, Jeff, Linda, program director, and Stefan Wild, uh, secretary. Um, and he says he's also the treasurer, but there is no treasure. So <laughs> anyway, so um, everybody's here, all of us. So, you know, pop us questions and um, um, all right. Um, so what first thing is, is a pleasure to uh, list the fellows, the new uh, SIAG opt fellows, that is the SIAM fellows that are members of our uh, interest group um, since the last uh, business meeting, and that's four years. So class of 2018, Helen Moore, uh, Pablo Parillo, Tamash Terlaki, Kim Chuan To, Homer Walker, 2019, Mihai Nitesco, Jesus Dara, Ahru, Juan Meza, Yin Zhang, a class of 2020 is Richard Bird, David Gay, Defeng Son, and the uh, class of 2021 is Jim uh, Xiao Chun Chen and Andreas Wechter. And I just want to congratulate them all for joining Cyan Fellow Group. Okay, so a few announcements about just um, new ways of communication, you know, trying to keep up with the times, lots of ways to communicate, but one of the important things, and I'm sure you all have, I mean, since you're here, you all know about this, that we no longer have the standard mailing list that we used to have, um, that so many people have used. We now have Siam Engage, uh, basically website, and the um, uh, kind of the, the communication processes through that. You can submit your post, your message on Siam Engage and uh, post it to any group that you are a member of. And um, I have sent, for example, such a message about this business meeting to uh, all of you who are members of the group. 
um, you know, here you can list, uh, get the web dates. Um, there is a uh, new Siam blogs site where you can read the latest blog and blog yourself. Um, you know, you can contribute ideas to Siam News. Oops, sorry. And um, finally, uh, eventually, and uh, sooner in some sense, it would have we had a meeting last time, uh, last year, we would be looking for replacements for ourselves. So we would very much appreciate suggestions of people who would take uh, on after us. So you can make your suggestion there. And um, we will post these slides. I'm not 100% sure yet in what form or we'll discuss with Tim. We may just circulate them on Siam Engage or some other way. Okay. All right, so next, a little bit to statistics. Conference uh, history has been, you know, consistently growing. Well, there was some dips at various times, but um, there was a consistent growth and the, the community is flourishing this year. The numbers are a little bit, um, you know, different because what we have here uh, is 518 have been pre-registered as of a couple of days ago specifically indicating that they will be attending PSYOPT um, sessions because when you register, so, you know, this, this time around, we were registering for general annual meeting. And then there was a question with which ones we will attend. So if you just register for annual meeting and didn't indicate that you will attend PSYOPT, but you still could, uh, you wouldn't be counted here. So this is, it's a fairly healthy number, I'd say. And it's as much on par with the number of talks so probably people who are giving talks have, you know, specifically indicated that they will attend and the others might in and out. Um, and uh, that means that the number of talks is basically have really gone down because, you know, the number of participants is often somewhat higher than the number of talks. All right, this organizing of this meeting, uh, organization of this meeting has been, you know, a very complicated process. And I would really like to thank um you know the um uh basically the the organizers of the conference uh defend son and tamash Telaki, who were co-chairs and tamash was the outgoing um chair of the psyop and i really came for many many um suggestions and help and guidances in that direction um but he put a lot of effort and defend put a lot of effort in this conference and um uh, so I will list the local committee on the next slide, but basically uh, some of you probably know how it evolved, but it was supposed to be in Hong Kong in uh, May of 2020. And, uh, you know, in the in 2019, uh, there were relatively, I mean, serious complications because of the political situation um, in Hong Kong. And uh, was first not close to the university, but then it actually was in the center of the uh, of Hong Kong Polytech. And um, it was unclear whether we can conference. But finally, in the winter of 2000, I mean, end of 2009, things have to started to calm down, or maybe September, October. And it started to look like we can actually hold the conference um, in Hong Kong. And uh, it was really good news, but of course, then the um, the spread of uh, the pandemic began, and uh, it was actually quite funny. I don't remember when it was, uh, possibly December. We were talking uh, with the Feng and Tamash. Feng was saying that how conference in Hong Kong, and we were saying, okay, well, uh, we should probably have it in the U.S. And we were talking with Siam. And we're planning to have it in the US, but um, the Feng was telling us, no, 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 you don't understand. This is just not going to stay in China. This is a serious thing. We've never seen anything like this. And we were saying, ah, oh, come on. You know, there are these different diseases pop up and everybody panics, but it really happens. And of course, we'll, yes, of course we'll have it in the US. And we were supposed to, have it, um, for example, I think our, you know, us plan was to have it in Baltimore in the May of 2020, but um, then, you know, by March, it was clear that that's not happening. And <clears throat> so it had to be postponed. And so here we are 
with the fully virtual format of this meeting. Um, nevertheless, uh, so first, uh, the co-organizers and co-chairs and our organizing have to work very hard to, you know, change hands constantly, change the format, collect and recall the talks, make sure that people who submitted the talks, because we were pretty much in the process of, they were in the process of uh, starting to build a schedule from collected talks, and then it had to change. Uh, so these are the people who have um, uh, basically contributed to the program, but also uh, the local organizers uh, for the Hong Kong meeting have put a lot of effort initially, first of all, to be able to have it in Hong Kong, um, and then uh, to assist uh, to move it to um, sort of the new look and then the new format. So we really, really want to thank them for all the effort. Now, the question was, would they hold it in 2023, which is our next opt? We talked to Defang and he said that maybe a little bit too early because the, you know, just general situation may not stabilize by then. We are hoping to revisit the idea of uh, being Psyop in, in 2026. Okay. So uh, next topic is uh, SIAG opt views and news. Uh, hopefully you'll read it. Um, the co-editors that I would like to thank is Pietro Belotti and Somaya Wazaini. Um, they, you know, have effort into collecting very good and interesting contributions. Um, and uh, since the meeting, or since the last business meeting, there has been five volumes, uh, or depending how you count some volumes, uh, one volume in two, you know, pieces, I guess, a year. But in any case, uh, there will be, there should be another one coming after this meeting at some point, uh, not immediately. So you can see that there is a, uh, in December, 2017, there was an issue dedicated to the previous uh, SIAM optimization meeting. Okay. We have now prizes to our uh, group, and the activity group, and actually we're gonna talk about possibly having a third. Um, and the first prize is the best paper prize that's been around for a while. And this year, the recipients are uh, Hamza Fauzi, Pablo Parillo, and uh, James Sanderson. Um, and here is a citation. Will be so. I'm not going to talk much about the prizes because they will be presented. They, they will give talks, and will be kind of announced uh, during this um, best paper prize uh, session on Friday at 11 40 so please uh attend and you know listen to the, them talking about their work but i would like to uh, thank the committee which is mihai nitesco erling anderson tom coleman monique laurent and akiko yoshise um and with that i just want to say that sadly tom coleman passed away earlier this year in case uh, you did not know and there is actually a um uh, session uh, dedicated to him in Siam annual meeting that uh, you can find. I don't remember exactly what date. Um, I can look it up. Um, okay, and the new uh, newly established uh, award is the Early Career Prize, uh, and also the talk will be presented at the same prize session. Um, and this year's recipient is John Ducci, um, and it's given for the you know, a deep and important contribution to non convex and stochastic optimization, as well as on statistical foundation optimization methods and data science. Um, and um, I would like to thank the selection committee, which is Miguel Anjos, Marina Appleman, Jennifer Irway, Arvind uh, Ragunathan, and Stefan Ulrich. Okay, great. Uh, so, the final announcement is that uh, next summer there will be Jingolob Siam Summer, as there every summer. And I believe this summer is actually is this, which is, uh, it's, what well, is it, either last week? Uh, I know Karala Cartes is teaching there, uh, it's in South Africa. But next year's already, it will be in um, Italy. Uh, and, you know, you should just tell basically your students to apply. 
and you know the topic is learning and high performance being and there is um you know the, the the information can be found on this website here okay so now are the things that are works uh be by us as officers first of course is um the next meeting so the meeting will be held in 23 so not 2024 we're going back to the previous site with all meetings uh, icc uh by the way i mean you you probably already know but icc opt is going to happen next summer uh at lehigh university um and frank here is one of the co-chairs so uh you can pass to him with questions uh this is pertinent information because uh we may you know it may go into discussion of where SIAG opt will be located in 2023 so um the ismp is going to be stated in beijing it will be in next summer it was supposed to be the summer. it will be next summer uh, it will not intersect with SIA, with IC. There will be about you know a couple of weeks difference, so it's somewhere in mid, mid August, and uh, we hope to have a lot of in person participation, but there will be a virtual format because uh, there's few people may not be able to travel easily due to COVID and other possible you know issues. Uh, nevertheless. Uh, in Beijing, so SIAM, uh, SIOP 2023 will be in the US. As I um, said, basically, we reached out to Hong Kong. They think it might be too early. Uh, we did not really feel like this would be a good time to try to find another international location. Um, and the easiest solution would be to have it in the US. Uh, however, we have, uh, so the co-chairs are Jeff Linderoth and um, Coralia Cartis. Uh, so she's kindly uh, representing the rest of the world, so to, so to speak, outside the US. Um, and we are going to be deciding on locations sometime soon. If, if not deciding, at least exploring locations with uh, Siam's help. Uh, so if you have any suggestions about the locations, we can discuss it you know, here, and also you can send it to and Cora. So the, the you know, the, the key questions is basically US is a large place and do we want to closer to the coast, west coast, uh, somewhat middle of the country and what other things go in there. Um, then uh, another um, item we're working on uh, as a group is the new award. So we feel like since there's a session in SIOP meeting for um, you know award presentations, we can fit in three talks there. So we want the third uh, award. But but mainly we are also feeling like what is lacking in our community is sort of a mid-career awards. We have a real large number of young researcher awards and best paper awards, uh, but the mid-career awards. Basically, it's the Farkas Prize, uh, as far as we know, uh, from INFORMS. So uh, this is not exactly a mid-career award, but it's so it's a little bit different, but it's um, aimed to be such, let's put it this way. Uh, so we call it the test. I mean, it's a, it's a test of time award, as is known in other, uh, you know, other awards of this type. And uh, the idea basically is uh, that it will be awarded for a work with a significant and sustained influence in the field that was published less than 10 years ago and not more than two years ago. Uh, now, these dates now are, can be edited. So if you have you know, some objections, we can talk about this. Um, but, uh, but that's basically the plan. So it's a, some sort of award for a, Sustained contribution, but not like Danzig Prize, sustained contribution for a longer period of time and maybe multiple contributions. It can be for one paper or for a collection of papers, um, you know, in some sort of limited form, but not maybe, you know, um, and it should, should be somewhat reasonably contained one piece of work or one piece of one contribution, significant one. Um, so, um, as I said, the award is aimed at mid-career researchers, but no uh, restrictions are imposed on the time 
since the award is doctoral dissertation, doctoral degree. We have um, some questions still remaining as we kind of tune uh, this award proposal. Uh, one of them is whether we will allow software to be nominated for this. Because we know some software is very significant um, for um, our field and significant contributions. On the other hand, it's hard to judge uh, when the software has been published. And uh, in general, you know, judging software versus papers may create difficulty for the, uh, um, you know, the, the committee. So we would have happily have this discussion. Uh, and then I'm very quickly gonna just go through these slides and then we'll post them so you can see uh, then, but this is just the report uh, right now. Um, uh, so our SIAG is third largest in SIAG. Um, and it's, you know, almost as large as anything else except for um, as, uh, CSE which is by far larger than everybody else. Um, then, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, here is the membership profile. Um, you would see the huge dip in the student membership uh, starting 2011. This is just a counting fluke. It's not actually in the membership. There was some issues how they were counted. So it's, you know, steadily growing membership as usual. Um, so the number of students right now is slightly bigger members than non-students, which is fantastic, but it also means that once people stop being students, they often do not maintain their membership. Um, and that we also can discuss as a group and see what we can do about it. One of the things we're discussing amongst ourselves um, as, this, as officers is the fact that most likely a lot of students finish their PhDs and go in the industry and do not sustain the membership. Um, and the reason they don't sustain the membership is because they are uh, they won't get reimbursed for it because they don't have conference for it. And there's maybe no need for them to attend the conferences because it doesn't count towards their performance. So one of the um, suggestions to engage stronger the, um, the industry is to possibly have uh, Kind of career fair in SIOP meetings. It happened before, and, but there is no reason for it not to happen. It just needs to be organized, and of course, it's a little bit of a uh, of work. But uh, but we're interested in hearing your opinion whether it's worthwhile to do this. Now, uh, the, the the meetings are in May, so it's a little bit early for the hiring season yet. But it still would be good to. Uh, I think for people who are right in a year, for example, to uh, sample what's out there. And this way, industry will representatives and maintain the membership better. Uh, here is by geography, um, you know, whatever it is. This is the breakdown by gender. And uh, as you see, um, it happens. In general, more men are leaving Siam and Siam as a students, possibly correlated with the fact that more women go to the street after um, uh, their PhDs. So this is another consideration trying to gain the membership levels. Uh, membership floor type, uh, you know, as expected, majorities in academia and industry labs and government. I'm actually not sure whether Argonne is lab or government, but either way. Um, and uh, right, and then my membership type which is the yeah, operations, research, and politics, which is, of course, a very vague distinction. And finally, I don't think I need to show it to anybody here. There are some advantages of joining SIAP, SIAM. Uh, just encourage your students, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, and we'll be, you know, uh, happy to welcome them um, in the group. Um, okay, so with that, um, we should start discussing some of the items, but I will first wait uh, for 
question. So Sven, by the way, says any SIAM member can nominate two students for free membership each year. So it is really good to use this option. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, I would like to hear any questions. At this point, suggestions for questions. We, we have a few questions for you, but in terms of like these polls and whatever, but just feel free to go ahead and open a discussion. No, anybody? Okay, let, let, let me start with a poll, then maybe it will. Um, so I think the first poll I would like to have is the award. Uh, this is somewhat easy. So very simple. What do you think of the award? Uh, rather, okay, sorry, not what you think of the award. I, like, yes, uh, should, it, should it include software? You can also tell me what you think of the award, but that's, you know, we're, we're trying to go ahead with it anyway. Okay. Not everybody voted, but um, there is majority for yes. Uh, okay, Sven, Sven wants to say something. <laughs> no, I did not. I just said yes is good. I know. Well, that's <laughs> that's saying something. Um, so um, there is a difference in opinions. I, I actually really would love to hear both opinions. Why yes and why not? Because we'll need to kind of consider it when putting it in the language. If we are including software, what kind of pitfalls we may want to consider and uh, what there are the restrictions? How do we count the publication date? And if we don't include, then OK. Um. So for the discussion, I guess I'll bring up one of the key difficulties is that I am would really prefer, strongly prefer, that awards are associated with peer-reviewed work. And so one of the, their stumbling box blocks is whether you are requiring the committee evaluating this to effectively perform the peer review of a software packet in order to make the award. So I'll at least bring that up to stir the pot up. What do people think? Would the, would the paper that often goes with software, would that be sufficient? Uh, I, I think most, most software packages have papers. Well, and that, well then, I, I, I mean, the paper think, can be nominated. Well, and Go ahead. I think a lot of, uh, at least open source software, I mean, the, the peer review happens by it being used hundreds of times. I mean, to me, I think the, the peer review would be by looking at how often is the software being used in papers that are and being cited. I think you can make an argument that an algorithm that or a software package that where the, the manual has been uh, cited hundreds of times um, has been peer reviewed uh, in, in, in some sense better reviewed than a lot of articles that are uh, yeah, I would, I would actually, of people re review that. Yeah, I would argue that the whole point of test of time award is precisely to replace the peer review by the peer review. I mean, peer review in formal ways, as in journals, with the peer review as in be finding something useful, right? So that that's the whole point of a test of time award. Uh, nevertheless, uh, so that that's actually brings another question. I mean, should we? even insist that something is, if it's a paper, it has to be published in a, you know, a journal. Uh, I mean, in, in some sense, uh, I mean, should a book be considered for an award? Because, you know, books obviously have contributions. 
um, that are exactly lasting, you know, over 10 years. But it feels like that's probably not what we're after, especially if we're trying to reward mid-career researchers. Mm. So I, I, Katya, I voted no, <clears throat> because I thought that the software should be considered by itself and maybe something else created for software. Also because the papers usually do not correspond to the software really well. And concerning the book, I also think that you're gonna have so many good candidates for the test of time award that just keep it simple to papers. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, that, that's true. So Rob had a hand out, uh, up and then and, and, uh, Sven also. So Rob. Yeah, let's see. So I, I feel a little awkward to tell you the truth, uh, uh, voicing a negative sentiment about the software being for a test of time award, especially because as most of you know, I'm not exactly a software person myself, um, and, but I don't want that necessarily to be influencing my thinking. But I felt like I could see software awards in other categories, but for test of time, it almost feels um, paradoxical or something. That 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 do you want? Do you want an award for software that has you know stood the test of fifteen years, or do you really want? To, uh, that that to me sort of is almost indicates that the so that that people are not working in that area anymore. Now I guess you could argue that 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 maybe because nothing that that software was way ahead of its time i don't know um but again i, I feel slightly awkward but i did want to uh express that sentiment thank you okay Sven. so i would argue to keep it as flexible as possible uh the award including software and and books and papers um the argument that it should be peer reviewed is somewhat spurious because it, it assumes that peer review only happens through journals, which is of course not true for the test of time award. Um, there are plenty of software packages sort of going on to gym that, that have stood the test of time and that are older than 15, 20 years and that are being still being developed. So examples in optimization include as an opt, uh, Baron, Minus, Lancelot, Nitro to some extent. Um, in the wider field, Petsy is an excellent example of a software package that has stood the test of time. Uh, it's been used by other researchers to win awards. And, and so it's not a candidate for our prize. It's not an optimization software, but this would be an ideal candidate. So I would not be too narrow in the definition of what it means to withstand the test of time but leave that to the individual committee. So we actually had uh, in one of the discussions, um, uh, the, the idea that adding something that is not just test of time, but test of time in terms of use with, you know, practical use and using the industry and these kind of things, right? Uh, in, in the sense of connecting to the industry. We ultimately kind of felt that it may be too, as you're saying, too narrow. Um, and uh, maybe too complicated, but but I can't imagine that it will be difficult to compare something fundamentally theoretically profound that influenced some theoretical field, but had absolutely no, you know, <laughs> influence on algorithmic and computational uh, development versus a useful complicated package that basically just has a lot of engineering put into it and therefore is extremely well done. Um, and comparing such things may be very difficult for a committee, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's um, maybe it's fine. Maybe we should just let each committee run their, um, you know, do what they do and, and select the committees appropriately and just let them award uh, worthy individuals. I'm sure it will be worthy every time in some things. Katya, I just have a comment. So I, I voted no, but not because I didn't want to give an award for software, but I feel like there should be, I don't think we're at the risk yet of over rewarding ourselves in the community. I think I would have a test of time for a paper and I would have a, I don't know if you want to give like a test of time software or a lifetime software, some software package has been around for a long time, give it as a separate award. I feel like it's, 
a little bit strange in terms of one award for the software because you know the software maybe starts to come out but then it can continues continues to develop and like when are you actually giving it the snapshot for the test of time is a little bit awkward so why not have two true so we have as a as a as a sayag we have two awards already i think three is pretty much the max sayam will allow us that's my impression i mean not that they i don't know know if they have a limit but i don't think any actually stefan will correct me he knows much better but I think three is the maximum any SAG has. So I think we might be just pushing the envelope there. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, but, the, but it's, it's up to the CS, uh, SE community to award for software, no? <laughs> they should be doing it. Uh, because yeah, indeed software is probably broader than just optimization. Okay. All right, if no other strong feelings. So we, we hear you, I guess we'll, we'll talk again. And at all times, please send us follow-up thoughts. Uh, we are very happy to you know, um, hear and discuss with you uh, what you think. Then uh, my next call is, uh, sorry, okay. Um, what should be this? Let, let's start with job here. So this is going to be about actually, yeah, no, let's do this. Uh, so it's going to be all about uh, a meeting, right? So we're trying to decide what should happen in the, in the next meeting. So, um, oops, sorry, wrong one. I want to do this one. Uh, and So here is basically, let me explain a little before you start voting. So, so uh, just for, as an example, uh, we were considering, when we were considering 2020 location, there was, um, uh, for example, consideration of Orlando, which you know arguably is pleasant or not pleasant, but for some people, especially end of May, close to um, you know long uh, weekend, can be very appealing to bring the kids, go to the um, you know uh, Universal Studios or Disney World or whatever. Um, uh, it is not a super easy access from Europe. It is relatively easily accessed from East Coast, not so bad from the West Coast, but still it's a combination. So it's not as easy to say as Chicago, um, right? Uh, so then there's destinations such as Dallas, which again is arguably <laughs> pleasant or not pleasant, but but it has more appeal in terms of ease of access because of the large airport rather than the touristic destination. Um, then, you know, Baltimore is, you know, maybe not such an exciting place itself, but it's relatively easy to access and uh, close to interesting things like such as Washington DC, New York City, Philadelphia, and so on. So just, uh, you know, we wanna understand as we're searching whether we should only stick to something that has direct flights from Europe. I mean, here, most people are not from Europe, but nevertheless, if you value ease of access, then they do too. Um, so we're just trying to understand this. Okay. All right, almost everybody voted. So let me just show you the results. Yeah, so easy access. Um, <laughs> um, I know for a fact, not everybody thinks this way, but okay. <laughs> um, so uh, we will be looking at locations well, mostly it will be Jeff and Cora. Uh, there is, of course, restrictions in terms of what kind of hotel negotiations can happen and what, you know, how prices would be and what would be the registration fee. I didn't ask you this, but I assume registration fee is somewhat important for everybody, especially when you're sending students. So it should not be 
too excessive. Um, and uh, first of all, please send suggestions if you have. A great thing to do would be to have a local organizing committee. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have uh, two PhD students who graduated from Cornell, both in optimization um, and are moving to Johns Hopkins. So uh, I, I particularly wanted to stick to the Baltimore idea because then I, I was hoping to rope them in into the local organizing committee. Uh, however, as I brought up before, since IPC op is happening at Lehigh, I'm not sure this is such a good idea to, you know, next year have to Baltimore just because it's like it's very close, um, and maybe people want more geographic spread or you know fairness, so to speak. But I don't know if it matters. Um, yes, Sven votes Hawaii, Hawaii, exactly. I think everybody will go there, <laughs> despite the fact that it's not an easy location. Um, yes, I agree. Um, but anybody has uh, any comments to make here, such as saying, I'm happy to help with the organization if you have it in city near me or <laughs> anything else. Like we can have it in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example. <laughs> um. So Katya, maybe just a comment, um, because Siam typically negotiates a rate and, and everything with a, uh, with a venue, such as a hotel, there isn't really a need for a local organizing committee in the sense that you don't have to have your university behind it. You're not going right. to need a big right. infrastructure that you have to put in place. Um, so you may not actually need a local organizing committee. It's nice right. to have it. It's nice to have local yeah. input, yeah. Um, but it's not really necessary for Siam meetings. Right, no, no, 100%. I mean, that's why we kind of thought at this point, especially given that we only have two years, right, we're going to have it in the U.S. because we don't need it. I only mean that the location that would have such a support may, be, you know, have preference, but yeah. Um, So for example, in Hawaii, probably not, but <laughs> no problem there. So any other thoughts? Miguel has a question in the chat. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry, my connection's not very good. So I just typed it in, but uh, Sven, following on your comment, um, does the fact that Sion does these negotiations for the venue, I would assume that it does put some restrictions or limits on where we could, you know, if we want to do it in Nepal, they'll probably not be so happy about it. No, no, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we give them the cities and they, they tell us, um, they like select three and they give us the, you know, basically the breakdown of like how much the rooms would be, how much the registration fee would end up being roughly and uh, we choose. Uh, and then there's some other things to consider. For example, so I think Orlando, for example, was quite well-priced. I mean, Baltimore eventually turned out to be really well-priced, uh, but Orlando was very well-priced as well. But so, I, I mean, many of you remember, for example, um, San Diego. Uh, so there were two meetings in San Diego. The more recent one actually uh, was, they developed their light rail, I think, and there was a small, so there were actually places to go eat and you could have public transportation. But before that, and I forget, it wasn't SIOP, I guess it was an informs, but I think it was in the same location. There was no way to get out of that hotel area without a car. And um, it may be similar in Orlando. I mean, they're, they're like nice hotels with great pools and whatever, but you have to have a car to go around. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's very nice for a um, conference. Uh, so it could be as much as I personally love going to Orlando or whatever. <laughs> it's, um, it's just not, not ideal. So yeah, there, there are these, uh, besides prices, there are other considerations that we may think of. Okay, uh, let me move on to the next poll about uh, a conference thing. Uh, so job fairs, um, so should we have uh, industry job fair in SIOP conferences?
Okay. Not everybody's awake, so <laughs> don't be excited. Um, all right, so nobody said no so far, which is interesting because I thought somebody would say no, and I would love to hear why, but nobody said no. Uh, some people said no opinion, okay. Uh, and um, let me share the results, basically, 71 people, 71 percent of people said yes. Yeah, I honestly, I also don't see the downside, uh, except for I have no idea what goes into having one. And I don't want to overburden um, the organizing committee. And that might actually depend on the location, right? I mean, this, this may dictate uh, the location preference or the other way around the location may dictate what kind of career fair we might possibly have. Um, but this hopefully will attract some industry. Um, any other thoughts? So any thoughts on that in general? Any ideas? I don't even know if any SIAM meetings have industry job fairs. Does annual meeting have that? No, they have panels. Yes, yeah, CSA has a job fair every time. OK. Do you know how complicated it is to organize? I think that SIAM has an excellent and active SIAM industry committee that would love to take up some of that work so that the organizers don't have to deal with it. Perfect. Sven? Yeah, yeah SIAM, SIAM normally deals with all of that. Uh, they, they send emails to, for example, the national labs and, and industry representatives to get them to come to the job fair. Um, I voted yes, but I was in two minds. I could have voted no as well. The, the reason against it might be that SIAM just may be too small a meeting. So CSEE is much bigger. Um, it's not clear that it will be such an active event for us or how active it will be. It depends largely how many people who are sort of participating here and who are in the conference are prepared to go to the job fair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, it's small, but it's a very highly qualified crowd. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I think it, it will. Yes, sorry. I think it will, will really depend on kind of like where, for example, we are going uh, within our hiring cycle, right? I mean, we've been uh, not hiring for a while, but hopefully by by that time we will be back in, you know, hiring mode and then sign up would, would be a good good place to, to find qualified people. Um, but who knows kind of from our perspective, I don't know how well we, where we are with regard to planning to have job openings uh, aligned with that timing. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think for, for getting also early career folks that, that are in the industry to go to a conference, um, like the location and cost will be also a really important thing. Uh, and Sven, I love the idea of Hawaii, but I also know going to your manager as an early career person saying, I need to go to a conference in Hawaii. It's, it's, a, it's a much tougher uh, much tougher conversation than saying, I need to go to, um, to Boston to, to a conference <laughs> because it will, the perception is just going to be there that yeah that's a working meeting and you're not going for fun. And and recru recruiting new talent in Hawaii can be much easier. <laughs> uh, right, but again, I'm I'm thinking you, if the idea is you want to be able to to have people early career people that are in industry right. being able to attend a conference, I think. Thinking about the perception of the location uh, is, is important. Um, because I, I had this where we had an internal leadership development program and we actually went to Disneyland to learn how it's being worked. And so we actually got tour behind the scene and man, did we get a lot of flack of, oh, you're not actually doing work 
even though we were working a lot, right. but just people hearing you're going to Disneyland created perception issues that right. um, took quite a while to overcome. Right, right, sure. Sure, yeah. Okay, so I have one uh, last um, uh, poll to share. Sorry, and this is actually very much related to what uh, Jorg was just saying. So uh, should future setup conferences maintain a hybrid mode or not? I mean, not, we, we do believe, everybody now believes that this is a good idea to record all the talks, right? Because we've learned the technology, it seems to be doable. Um, and of course, there's an issue, whom do we make it available to, right? It's the people who registered for the conference, sure, but the people who register for just the virtual part of the conference, and how should we maintain it? And yeah, there, there is, there, this is a very complicated question, in my opinion, because um, as Yorg was just saying, you know, even, I mean, whether we have it in Hawaii or Boston, if you say you have to go to a conference, your uh, manager uh, might say, well, just attend virtually. And I don't think it works. Um, some people think it works, some people think it don't. Of course, making it available is good uh, in a sense of reaching out to people who absolutely cannot come otherwise. If they can't come, um, they, you know, this is an option for them to participate if they can't physically travel. Uh, but for many people, it, I think it will raise a question whether they should come and attending virtual just does not bring the same type of interaction. And so that's the result in my opinion. Um, so I'm just waiting for the results to trickle in. So, so while you're doing that, I think Richard Moore turned on his video. Uh, so maybe Richard can speak something about what Siam's thinking about these, because I think presumably yes. the conference would be restricted by what Siam is doing. Sure. Across. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, and um, thanks for bringing this up. I think it's a very important question. Uh, I just wanted to make the comment that we do find that several of the same companies like to participate in our career fairs for CSE, for annual meeting, and now, of course, for data science as well. We do try to focus on the bigger conferences, which includes optimization, but we do have to be mindful of how it fits into the calendar so we don't you know, tap the same well uh, too many times, for instance. So I'll just bring that up as well. Uh, we're also very much looking into the possibility of continuing the virtual career fairs going forward. Um, and we're trying to look at aligning those virtual career fairs a little better with the, uh, the recruitment calendar. Uh, as opposed to necessarily having them co-located with conferences. So for instance, at the annual meeting this year, the career fair isn't um, concurrent in time with the annual meeting, it's rather being held in October. And that's to align it a little better with the fall hiring uh, calendar. So these are just some things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, and as Stefan says, so not only do we have a very active industry committee, but we also have the, the Career Opportunities Committee, which plays a big role in organizing career fairs. Uh, and as Tim mentioned in the chat, uh, we are very uh, enthusiastic um, to have uh, lots of help from uh, from the activity group in finding companies to come to the career fairs. Great, thank you, Sven. You you have a raised hand, but maybe it's from before. I don't know. Yeah, that was from before, but. Um... I actually like the I actually like to continue hybrid meetings if that's possible if you can find a way of doing it because it uh, allows people from other countries to participate from developing countries for example and I think that's maybe one of the good things coming out of the pandemic is that there are more opportunities for people in developing countries to attend these big international meetings and so I'm actually in favor of trying to enhance somehow include uh, accessibility in some form of hybrid conference for people who would otherwise not be able to, to attend these meetings. Um, I'll so raise when, my, I'll lower my hand now. Yeah, I, I, my concern is that while we allow them to participate, the mode of participation is very different and it still creates a very big gap between people who are in the room and people who are not in the room. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I don't even know if this would be, I mean, I, 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 I do think, uh, I do think it's a good idea to 
somehow utilize what we've learned, what we're able to do to bring in people who are otherwise not able to attend. But um, yeah, in what form is not very clear to me. Um, anybody else wants to say something? I think I think Sven made some good points, but I would hope um, he said if it can be done well or if we have the facilities to do so. And then every time I've been to a, uh, say a mini symposium where there's uh, somewhat of a hybrid mode or someone had a visa issue and couldn't give a talk or something, um, or or there's trying to be audience participation, it's really we we don't ever seem to be set up for it. Um, I don't know if conferences will adapt in the future, but just say a laptop with a mic. I've been I've been virtual and hybrid. I've been real life and hybrid, and every time it's been the worst of the three options of in person, virtual, or hybrid. Hybrid has been the worst, in my opinion. I would rather vote for a virtual if you want to make it accessible to others. But the 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 joint hybrid it really raises the question: like, great, you you have people flying somewhere to then just be in a virtual setting or something. I I don't know. The the infrastructure I think would have to be different than a laptop in the middle of a a hotel conference chat room. And actually, I mean, maybe Richard can say something about this. Uh, was there any discussion with Sayam how to even, um, you know, distinguish this participation? I mean, obviously, it shouldn't be the same registration fee, right, for somebody who's doing it virtually. But should it be open to everybody, or like there's this would be, a, and and is there a conversation about recording and posting all these? Um, um, talks for example yes all of the above um at the moment we haven't settled on one on one model we do intend uh to have some form of hybrid participation uh what that looks like hasn't been figured out yet partly because the costs uh they vary so much among the different options uh, we've discussed having as opposed to hybrid mini symposia mini symposia broken into strictly in person and strictly virtual um, as one possibility, we've discussed having the, uh, the virtual participation be simply on a recording basis, so on demand after the conference ends. Um, certain things are very easy, like streaming uh, invited plenaries, for instance, um, even having questions asked from the virtual participants that are then uh, mediated by the, the chair of the session. Um, but we'll settle on something hopefully soon uh, and start to experiment in 2022 with uh, whatever model seems to have the most promise going forward. Great. Okay. Now we'll take a cue from you. Um, okay. Well, our time is up. Uh, please send us any more comments about anything we said here today. Join our discussion. Um, and I just want to thank you all for participating. Um, if anybody has anything urgent to say, you can pop it into the chat but, uh, or just speak. But otherwise, uh, really thank you for coming. It was good to see you, if only virtually, and hope to see you soon in person. Bye. And thank you, Tim and Nicole, for support of this meeting. <laughs>